kind of easy, right? When you consider, as we did, what He's done for us. Do you love the person sitting two rows behind you? Or two rows in front of you? That's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> but our love for Jesus, in some way, is actually measured by our love for one another. In fact, that's what Jesus said in John chapter 13. He says, all men will know that you're disciples of mine by this, by the love that you have for one another. That's what we want to talk about this morning. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. The question we want to answer is what do we do when we see our brother falling away? What do we do when our sister is starting these behaviors, these, these, these patterns of, of destructive and sinful behavior. Well, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus warned His disciples against causing other people to stumble, against causing other people to sin. That's what the first half of the chapter is about, verses 1 through uh, 11. Then in verse 12, He shifts His perspective from the, the offender's point of view, I don't want to cause my brother to sin, to the person offended. Well, now my brother sinned against me. Now my brother is, is the one sinning. And so what do we do when we notice that happening? Well, Jesus has a few verses here on this, and I think this section of the Bible will sum up all of the teaching on church discipline that, um, that, we, can, that we can learn. And I think what what Paul has to say about it. Uh, oftentimes what we do when we talk about church discipline is we go straight to 1 Corinthians, we go to Romans, we go every place but here. Right? But what Paul is talking about is he's, he's simply making the application of what Jesus is talking about right here. So let's stay here this morning. We'll talk about discipline, we'll talk about what do we do when our brother sins, and then this evening, uh, we always encourage you to come back but um, I really want to emphasize that you do come back tonight if, if you're available. We want to talk about if this fails, then what do we do? Okay, we talk about with, withdrawal this evening. And I want to say this right off the bat, that withdrawal means nothing if we're not doing this right here. Okay, so we've got to understand this if we want to understand withdrawal. And hopefully that will be clear um, after, after this lesson. So what do we do when our brother sins? Well, verses 15 through 20 gives us our answer. It's not to write off our brother. Well, he's just a problem case. I, well, I hope he just goes away or hope he just stops doing that. It's not just to pray for him. It's not to get rid of him, but it's to win him back. That's what Jesus says. That's your duty. That's my duty. When we see each other sinning, you win me back and I win you back to the Lord. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. And doesn't that make sense? What's our, what's our vocation as, as forgiven sinners? What are, we, what are we here to do? We're here to save people, aren't we? We are here to reconcile people to God. My neighbor down the street and the person sitting next to you in the pew or two rows in front of you or whatever. We are here to win people to God. That never changes. That never changes. That is the singular focus of the Christian and when we forget that, then we, we really go astray. Uh, but it, our approach may change, right? If we're teaching our unbeliever, well, he doesn't know as much maybe as the person sitting next to you in the pew. And so it, it's a role of, of, of teaching. It's a role of trying to teach him the, the, the fundamentals of the gospel. But if our brother sins, he might know the fundamentals of the gospel, and so the role changes of one of discipline. But the goal is still the same. The goal is to reconcile, is to bring peace. It's, it's to bring this person back in a, in a relationship with God. Let's set up the context very quickly. In verse 15, you notice the word brother. I appreciate so much the song that James picked out for, for, for just before the lesson and being part of God's family. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about your neighbor down the street. He's talking about the person sitting next to you in the pew. If your brother sins, this is denoting a family relationship. Okay, but, but here it's, it's, it's the relationship we enjoy in God's family. In our case, these verses apply to this congregation, 
to how we treat each other at, at the Danville Church of Christ, to the person sitting next to you in this household of God. And I emphasize again the teaching that we read about uh, in, in 1 and 2 Corinthians and Romans and Titus, 1 and 2 Thessalonians about church discipline. It's simply echoing what Jesus is teaching right here. And so let's dive into this text, the three very simple steps. We want to be thorough about this. Three very simple steps. What do I do if my brother has sinned, not just against me, but if he sinned against, against the Lord? Well, verse, uh, the, the first uh, step here in verse 15 is to privately reprove. If your brother sins, we're taught, you don't retaliate against him. Right? Jesus talked about that in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5. It's not an eye for an eye. It's not a tooth for a tooth. That's not how people work in my kingdom. You don't retaliate against one another. He says, uh, you, you're also not to, to, to complain about him. Right? If your brother sins against you, then you talk to your wife about it in the car and, and, and berate him in front of your children. If your brother sins, you write an email to the elders of the church or to the preacher. If, if your brother sins, then you write a vague Facebook post about him. But don't mention him by name, but just, just so you know that everyone else knows that you're angry. That's not what Jesus says here. That's not what he says at all. It's, it's not to wallow in self-pity. It's not to complain. It's not to gossip and tear down. The answer is twofold, and they're, they're both parts of it are important. He says, privately reprove. That's, that's the answer. You are to show him his fault. You are to rebuke your brother. He doesn't say pray for your brother, okay? If your brother sins, don't go home and pray for him. If your brother sins, you go to him and you show him his fault. You need to make it clear. Brother, here's, here's what I'm seeing here. This is, this is where you have sinned. Why is this important? Why does he open with this? If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. Because if there's no rebuke, you can't win your brother. If there's no rebuke, you've lost him. Why? Because if there's no rebuke, then he's, con he's going to continue in, in, in a behavior that is harmful to him and that's harmful to others. And he's lost to God. And so we're losing sight of our goal. Jesus is reminding us the goal is to win our brother, is to create a peaceful relationship between your brother and God and your brother and yourself. That's your, that's your vocation. Reconnect this person with God. How do you do that? You can't do that unless you go to your brother and you show him his fault. A person cannot be connected to God, cannot have fellowship with God if he continues a pattern of sinful behavior. Again, let's keep this in context. We're not talking about the guy down the street. We're talking about Members of the Lord's church. That's what we're talking about here. So for there to be forgiveness, there's got to be rebu rebuke. You've got to go to your brother. You've got to say, listen, I love you. Here's what I'm seeing. You, you've, you've crossed the line here. And some of us, we fail right here at step number one. We don't do step number one. And then we don't do step number two. And then we jump on in step number three. And then, and then, you know, this, this person gets a letter in the mail that he's been withdrawn from and that he's being disciplined by the church, and he's like, what, what have I done? Do you see how important this step is? Verse 15 is the key. You've got to start here. You've got to individually go to your brother and show him his fault. If you failed at step one, nothing else is going to make sense. When we saw his sinful behavior and we said absolutely nothing and we've watched our brother just fall away and fall away and fall away and we've said nothing, then are we peacemakers? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be sons of God. When we don't go to our brother and show him his fault, we're not acting like God's children. We're not acting like sons of God because reconciliation really isn't that important. What's important to us is that we don't rock the boat. But that's, we're losing sight of our goal now. Our goal is to win our brother. Not, we're not keeping the peace by avoiding confrontation. You know what we're doing by avoiding confrontation? We're perpetuating discord. We're, we're, by allowing sin to continue in, in the lives of people that we love, we're not, we're not keeping the peace. We're perpetuating discord in the Lord's church. 
And Jesus says, you've got to love your brother enough to go up to him and say, listen, brother, I love you, but here, there's, a, there's an issue going on here. Let's talk about this. Let me show you your, your fault. That's uncomfortable. It's extremely uncomfortable. How do I do that, Jesus? Well, he tells you. You do it privately. Literally, the phrase, I appreciate Connor's translation, between you and him alone. Between you and him alone. You don't get on Facebook. You don't write an email. You don't go talk to your wife. You go to your brother. You go to your sister. You and him alone. That's every Christian's job. Now, why is that important? Remember our goal? is to win our brother. And so, if that's our goal, we need to make it as easy as possible for our brother to, to see his fault, to confess his fault, and to be reconciled to God. And Jesus says the best way to do that is don't do it in a public setting. Don't bring anyone else into this. You do it just between you and him alone. That's the best way to facilitate this reconciliation privately. Close the door. Look him in the eye and tell him that there's no one else involved here. I know about this. I see this. I'm bringing this to you because I love you. And things need to change, brother. And here's why. Here's a couple verses. Do you see it? You show it to him privately. Privately. Why, why, why do we do it privately? Because if we bring in someone else, or if we call attention to, to his sin publicly, then, then at, we've undermined our whole goal. Our whole goal is to win our brother. And if we bring other people in, then he's likely going to respond in, in anger and with denial instead of, instead of repentance. But if we do this privately, it makes repentance easier, you see. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, Peter says, above all, he says, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Is, is he saying here that if we love our brother, then we're going to cover up and we're going to hide his sin? We're going to overlook his sin? No, not at all. See, love acts like an umbrella, right? It's raining sin. I'm going to come with my umbrella and stand next to you so you don't get touched by it. That's what love does. It covers a multitude of sins. Love acts to stop the pain, to break the cycle. It works together for peace. That doesn't happen unless you go to your brother privately and you rebuke him, you show him his fault. James chapter 5, in verses 19 and 20, the very last verses of the book of James. James says in verse 19, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, and one turns him back. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's our goal. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You see what happened there? You broke the cycle. You stopped the sin. You brought your brother back to God. You've won the day. There are angels in heaven rejoicing because you loved your brother enough to go to him privately and show him where he was wrong. You see how important that is? If we miss step number one, we've missed it all. Nothing else makes sense. These are building blocks. So what, what do we do if that doesn't work? Well, we'll get there in a minute. But love confronts. Love goes, right? That's what love does. Love doesn't stay. Love doesn't keep your mouth shut. Love goes. You have that difficult talk because you want to reconcile your brother. Just like verse 12 of Matthew chapter 18. The shepherd loves his sheep so much, he loves that one that was lost, that he makes the difficult decision that to go on that journey and go looking for that one sheep, he's going to leave the 99. That's hard to do. But love goes and looks for the one sheep. We've all got to do the same when it comes to church discipline. Our goal is to win our brother so that there can be rejoicing. Like in verse 13, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have not gone astray. And that's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard to leave the safety of the fold, right? Here are the faithful people. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing. I don't want to go over brother so-and-so's house or sister so-and-so's house because they're just trouble, right? That's why we refuse to do it. Because 
if we're going to boil this down and just be totally honest with it, it's an unwillingness to get involved in another person's life. It's just too messy, and my life is just good the way it is. That's just, that's just not the way this kingdom is going to work. That's not the way Jesus presents these relationships. We love each other too much to, to, to allow this behavior to continue. We love each other so much we make the hard decision to go out and, and, and to go over someone's house, to make the phone call, to write the letter, to do what we can do to reach out and go to him privately and show him his fault so we can make things right. And remember the goal is reconciliation. I know I've said it every fifth sentence of this sermon. Get used to it. <laughs> That's the goal. The goal is to, is to make peace. Not just physical peace so there's no arguing. No, the goal is to make a spiritual peace between the sinner and God. Did you notice verse 15? If, you're, you're the one who's being sinned against there, right? And then you go over to chapter 5. Keep your finger there and go to chapter 5. Notice what Jesus says there in verse 23 and 24. He says, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, now who's, who's the one who's done wrong? Now you're the one, right? You're the sinner. He's got something against you. What does he say to do? Leave your offering there before the altar and, there's our word, go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So in chapter 5, the offender is told to go to the offended. In chapter 18, the offended is told to go to the offender. Why? To reconcile. What's the point? What's Jesus trying to teach us between Matthew 5 and Matthew chapter 18? Whenever, whenever sin alienates brethren, it doesn't matter who's guilty and who's innocent. What matters most is to be reconciled to God. That's what matters most. That, is, that has got to be in the forefront of our minds, being right with our Heavenly Father. And too often, we miss this first step. Too often, brethren, personal confrontation, because we want to keep the peace or because whatever, is the last step instead of the first step. And the whole world knows about my sin before I do. Why? Because 134, 33 people didn't come and tell me. You see? And then there's this, there's this separation that occurs between me and my brethren. And then I stop coming to service. And I'm slipping away. I'm slipping away. I'm no longer praying. I'm no longer worshiping God. I'm no longer part of any local congregation. And then I get this letter in the mail. What is that? What is that? It means nothing if my brother has not come to me and shown me my fault in private. You can't, we can't miss this step. That's, sh that's shameful. And frankly, we can do better than that because we love each other too much. I'm not talking about being, you know, Facebook police or being, you know, you know, the police in somebody's life and noticing every little thing that they do. I'm just talking about being part of each other's lives in such a way that we, we see when we're, when we're weakening. And we give that encouragement when it's most needed. And then when we do see something obvious, we've got to go, we've got to show our, our brother his, his sin in private. Step two, what if that doesn't work? Well, if reconciliation fails, look at verse 16. He says we're all to involve other people. If he refuses to listen to them, or excuse me, verse 16, but if he does not listen to you, Take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And so if reconciliation fails at step number one, you need to reconsider the issue with one or two more. And he quotes the law here, Deuteronomy 19. Why? Well, he says, so that uh, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. It, are the purpose of the witnesses only to confirm, to hear the grievance? Right? I went to you in private, I, I loved you, I talked with you, you didn't listen to me, so I brought along two of my brothers with me and say, look, see, I told you, he's trouble. Don't listen to him. Listen to his story. See? Is it just to hear the grievance? What's the goal? <laughs> the goal is reconciliation, isn't it? Verse 17a, right? That's, that's implied. 
if he refuses to listen to them. To who? To you and the two other witnesses that went with you. The goal has never changed. What you've done is you've brought in two more people. The point of, of adding witnesses is not just to hear the grievance. The point of adding witnesses of, of the testimony of two other people is to add force to persuasion. See? Multiple testimony is stronger. If you come to me and say, you know, Brother Jerome, here's what I'm seeing. Tell me I'm wrong. What's going on in your life? We've got to fix this, brother. I love you too much to allow you to do this. I say, wow. That's just, that's just brother so-and-so. He just says that about everybody. What if he brings in two other people that I greatly respect? Whoa. You, you mean you're not the only one who's saying this? Well, may, maybe there is something going on here. You see what Jesus is doing here? Bringing one or two other people in with you, that's designed to turn up the heat to accomplish the goal. And it's important that the people you bring in, of course, be people of integrity. You know, be people that you can trust. Right? That can be, remain confidential. That, ha that, are, that are trying to live a, a godly life, of course. Not perfect, not sinless, certainly. But people who are men of, of honesty and integrity. So it's designed to be, to, to, to be more persuasive. And again, I think what Jesus is advocating is here, here is that we exercise wisdom and tact. I'll tell you what, to bring an accusation against somebody, you really want to be careful. You really want to be careful. There's a fine line between Matthew 7, verses 1 and following, and John 7, verse 24. Judging by appearances and judging righteous judgment. You need to make sure you've got the facts. You need to make sure that you use discretion. Because when you make an allegation of some, uh, against somebody, that is extremely serious. We need to be judging with righteous judgment according to the facts because we love our brother so we can win him back. So what do we do if that fails? Well, verse 17. Verse 17. You publicly report it. Again, verse, verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, you, you came to him privately, you've, you've loved him enough to show him his fault, he didn't listen to you. You brought two, two people with you, and they brought in their testimony, and they're, they're telling him as well that there's something wrong, there's something that needs to change, and now he doesn't listen to them either. Well, Jesus says, tell it to the church. Tell it to the church. If your brother refuses to change before the witnesses, you need to bring it before the church. Now, that word church... Uh, is used in the Gospels only twice. It's used right here, and it's used in Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, Jesus uses it in a universal sense. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Right here, he's using it in a local setting. Okay, the assembly of uh, the assembly of of Rome. You know, the church at Corinth, the church at Danville. Bring it before the, uh, a local congregation. There. So the brother who who the idea is the brother who brought the charge should tell the congregation the story, the witnesses should give their testimony, and then what happens? And then we send them a letter. No. It's not what Jesus says. Look at verse 17 again. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church. Now what does that imply? That implies, now that the matter has become public, Every member of a local church needs to be reaching out. Every single one. He's supposed to be listening to the church. What's the church? Every, the church, what, what, what makes up the church? But individuals. And so everybody is reaching out and giving, and giving their testimony and, and calling them and sending them a letter or dropping by or, or meeting with them face to face. What do we see here? The unrepentant sin must be uncovered. We're dealing with a person here who's, who's unwilling to change. And he says, if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. We'll talk about that in, in just a moment here. So if every effort has been made to resolve the issue privately, then Jesus says, this issue needs to be made known to the group. Everybody needs to know. Why? So we could all gossip about him at lunch on Sunday? No, 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 no. Why does he want every single member of a church to know one brother's sin? Is it to shame him? Is it to make this person just, just feel rotten about himself? 
so we can say mean things about him behind his back? No. The goal is to, yeah, win our brother back. And so what is he after? Why do we need to know about it? We need to be informed about our brother's sin so that I have the ammunition to go to my brother and say, listen, I love you, this, that, and the other, right? Here's what has to change. Can you meet? Can we study? Can we pray together? Can we get together and talk about this? Right? The goal is reconciliation, right? Reconciliation is every member's job. And if, if you're not a member here, if you're not a member of the Danville Church of Christ, we love you and we are so glad that you're here. But what we're talking about today is how we treat each other. Okay? This the, reconciliation is every member's job. And let me just say this to the members here. We announce people that are falling away, that are weakening in the faith. We read letters. You know what we're doing when we read a letter? We're doing, we're doing verse 17. We're making it known. We're making it public. Do you know why we do that? It's so that you know what's going on. And so that you and me can reach out to this person individually. And so let me just say, if you have not contacted the people that we pray for in this assembly, the people that we mention in this assembly, you are not pulling your weight in this local church. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. It's every member's job. It is the church's job. How are we doing at that? Have we contacted these young people? Have we contacted the people that have fallen away even since I've been here just over a year? If we haven't, then we need to. That we need to be about the business of, of making peace, of reconciliation. And if we're not unified in this effort, if, if half of the congregation is on board and the other congregation doesn't see anything wrong with it or doesn't even reach out, well, then our goal is undermined here. And we're not going to be as effective as we should be to bring this person back to the Lord. That is, that's the goal here, to bring him back to the Lord. And again, the erring brother is subject to discipline. If all of our efforts fail, Jesus says he is to be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. That is the collective attitude of this congregation. And that, that's Jesus' way uh, of, of saying he, he is to be to you as an outsider. Right? As an unbeliever. You're to regard him in that way. If, if a brother refuses to repent and recognize the, spirituality, or the spiritual reality, then, then that's how you are to regard him. And the spiritual reality is that a brother, right? we're not talking about unbelievers, we're talking about brethren, who have known the grace of God, who have heard the story of how Jesus redeemed them from their sin, how the Son of God came down in human form, lived a perfect life, loved his neighbor like no one else had, was rejected for it, was nailed to a cross. Why? So that this person could receive the forgiveness of sins. That person has now walked away from that cross. That person said, Thanks, but no thanks. He has willfully chosen to disdain the sacrifice after several attempts, after every individual of the church has reached out to him. If he still refuses, then do we already regard him as a Gentile and a tax collector? That's an idiom for have no association with him. Withdraw from him, avoid such a one. This is what Paul is talking about, we'll talk about tonight. And you say, well, wow, well, that doesn't sound very nice, does it, you know? Are we just trying to hurt this person? How is that going to help? Has our goal suddenly changed? The answer is no. The goal has not changed. It never changes. The purpose of this discipline, the purpose of this tough love, is to win our brother back. That's Jesus' way. Let me just say from verse 18 that church discipline is the will of God. It's the will of God. Read verse 18 with me. Truly I say to you that if two or uh, two of you, excuse me, I'm reading verse 19. Let's start over. Verse 18. <laughs> Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. 
So what he's saying in verse 18 is in relation to the decision that is made in verse 17. The decision that he made in verse 17 is, if this brother refuses to recognize his fault, if he just ignores you, then you need to regard him as an outsider, as a Gentile or tax collector. And then Jesus says this. Right, you've reached a decision. It's heaven's will. Jesus isn't saying that when a church makes a decision on fellowship that it's binding on God. Right? He's actually saying the opposite here. Withdrawal is our way of recognizing a spiritual reality. This, this disciplinary action that we take against a brother who refuses to change his lifestyle, who continues to, to, to mock the, the sacrifice of Jesus, it is God's will that a local church must honor. And Jesus explains it even further in the next couple of verses. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Again, he's continuing the thought of verse 18. These verses do not, do not refer to the number of Christians it takes to, you know, constitute a worship service. That is an abuse of this text. What this text is teaching is that where, where the mouth, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, well, who's two or three? The two or three witnesses that you brought before your erring brother. If they've agreed on the issue and they're taking the, the, the steps, then it's God's will that this person would be withdrawn from. When witnesses agree about a judicial matter, when we're going by the facts, we're not judging by appearances, when we're going by the facts and we're loving our brother enough to tell him his fault, then their recommendation to the congregation to withdraw from this person carries the authority of God himself. I, listen, I, I studied this with fresh eyes the last two weeks, and that's how I understand this text. And if I am wrong, verse 15, please. <laughs> okay? Please, privately. Yeah. You, you, does that make sense to you? Okay? This is, the author this is with the authority of God that we do this. Th in verse cha uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in the very context of church discipline, and this is what Paul is arguing for. He's arguing for, for these brethren to, to remove this evil one from their midst, right? He's, he's, he's corrupting the, the church and the, the, the influence of the church and the community of Corinth. And he's saying you need to, to discipline this person. How does he say that in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 5? In the name of our Lord Jesus. Well, what does that mean? Well, by his authority, right? By his authority, in his name. When you are assembled, I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, deliver such a one to Satan, right? He's not to, he's not to be part of this congregation anymore in Corinth. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and in verse 6, the same sort of things going on here. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, what does that mean? By the authority that, that Jesus gives. That you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you've received from us. And so when we, only when we start at verse 15 and we go through this process that Jesus gives of confronting love and we make this decision to withdraw from a brother is it the Lord's will that we do this? Now, we are fallible, and we can make mistakes, and we can judge incorrectly, but when the church follows the Lord's prescription here, His teaching, His will in dealing with disobedient brethren, then Jesus Himself sanctifies the action. Please close your Bibles, please. Open your songbooks. I thank you so much for your attention. And I know this is a difficult topic. But the hard, uh, one of the hardest commands in the Bible is to love the brethren. To love each other. And, and love necessitates that when we see something threatening the relationship of our brother with his God, that we don't stand by and do nothing. That we go to Him and we love Him and, 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 and we try to make things right. We do all within our power to make things right. 
Maybe, maybe people have done that to you before and you took it the wrong way. Understand, we're not perfect. We don't always do this the right way, but at least this is our intent, is to win you back. Maybe we've, we've been on the other side of the fence and we've been offended and we're the one going out and trying to reconcile. We need to do it the Lord's way if we want to be effective. So why do we take this so seriously? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Because Jesus is worth it. Because heaven is worth it. And He doesn't want anyone to perish. And if your relationship right now is not right with God, help us help you to make it right. Jesus says that if you're a Christian already, you've been immersed into His death and you've received the forgiveness of sins, but you've, you, you're making poor choices, your life is a mess, Jesus wants you to get right with God. This is my appeal to you to make things right and to ask for forgiveness right there where you sit. If you need to make it public, then make it public. But if you've never been immersed into Christ, if you're not part of the Lord's family, then become part of this family who, who, who is going to love you more than anyone else in the world. We're going to love you so much that, that we're going to be with you every step of the way and that you can correct me and I can correct you and we can be part of this family together. If you have a need, then let us know as we sing this song.